Okay. All right, Michael, you have the helm. All right. My name is Mike Bucciarelli, and tonight I'll be talking about how we just deal at photography with the white flex table and the black flex table. Part one will be in the white flex table, and part two will be in the black flex table. The first one is who I am. I started a professional photography in 2010. I got an associate degree in 2013. And then 2015, I joined Professional Photographers of America. And then in 2017 and later, I started joining some of the popular affiliate clubs like the Maryland Club, the Pennsylvania Club, this club. And I recently just became a member of ASP in 2021. And also, that's when I received my photography craftsman degree, turned virtual seminar. These are some white plexi images I'll be discussing. And some of these have entered in competition, some of them, I entered all of them. But I like to do food. I also like to do products with reflections. And there are ways to get these type of um, photographs with various techniques. So tonight's agenda, of course, we're going to talk about the white flex table. Of course, I'm going to talk about how to use the lights, the strobes, but I'm also going to talk about how to use simple lighting modifiers like white cards and gray cards and silver cards. And then I'll talk about camera settings. And then I'm going to have a quick demo of Adobe Camera Raw. When I do Photoshop, that's how I use actions and blend modes and filters. I use certain techniques to make my job easier, like combining actions. I use blend modes a little differently and filters. And if you have any questions, you can always email me at mputrelliart2016 at gmail.com. Like I said, these are all my still life tables. And tonight we're going to be focusing on the big black square, the white plex table. You can use these type of modifiers at any table, which includes the white plex class table. Like I'd recommend anything with dramatic light, I'd use a silver card any type of mirror or anything silver. Now, if you want the light a little softer, I would recommend a white card, a white reflector. Black cards are great for when a strobe bleeds too much light or if you want to take out a reflection on a product, that's when, it, that's when you want to use a black card. Then you have plastic fusion scrims or white reflective scrims where if you want to make the light softer, that's a good way to do it. You can also feather the light too. And then you have colorful gels where you can change the color of the subject and also color the backgrounds. I'll talk about that later. And then there's medium sized white plexiglass sheets where you could use it at a table, but you could also use it as a reflector, like how you use a plastic shrimp. It's a way to soften the light. And then a cinephil. It's really black aluminum foil where if you're in a tight budget, you can make a snoot. You could attach the cinefill with small spring clamps or duct tape or clothespins. Then there's blinds for natural light. And blind, this can be done with any table. When you have your subject, you want to have, make sure that the blinds are angling at a 45 degree angle. Then the next set, they hold things like spring clamps. These are great for holding stuff. And same thing with C or G clamps. At all sizes are great. Then you have duct tape. Duct tape is great for holding like gels to the strobe. You can do a lot with clothespins. You can have clothespins attach the gel to the strobe. A lot of these you can buy at an art store. You can buy a lot of this at a hardware store, and you can buy some of this at a drugstore like Safeway.
Hey, Michael, can you tell me how big that table is? This table? Yeah. This is pretty big. It's about three feet, and it's a good frame. I bought this at Amazon.com, and I got a good deal. But they sell this at BH, but they sell at the Manfred frame. But they're good, too. But I still use this very same table today. Okay, so that looks about what six feet deep, three by six, and it's it's contoured and it's a special table that you bought off Amazon. Yeah, yep. Make sure you have this curve, and when you when you use a table, you can make this go back. And also, there's a way to put the ledge up, which I'll show coming up with the um, spring clamps. So there's lots you can do with this table. Now, the many ways to use the white plexiglass table. You can have one light, two lights. You can mix the flash and continuous. You can use ambient light with the wild strobes. And two things are important. Angle the camera and position the light. Because when you have the light angled, you can bring out reflections. I'll talk about that later. And there's other ways you can position the light for other characteristics. In the next set of slides, I'm going to talk about how to use one light, and then two lights, then three lights. This is a very simple setup. You have a white background, you have one light, Paramount style. And I like to use white or black because it's easier in color correction. And then if you have something shiny, I'd recommend using you know, a plastic fusion screen or a white reflector to take out the harsh glare. You wanna make sure you get the product label out. Now there's many things, there's many ways you can use one light. You could have, you know, reflectors or white cards that bounce in light. You could have the light on this corner with reflectors or white cards or light on this corner with white cards. So there's many, you know, you could, there's so much you could do with one light. This is another way just to use one light where you have a glass subject, you have a white reflector strip where the light is shining at the camera and they'll shine right through the glass. And you probably want to lower your power strobe very low because these are very powerful strobes. You can do the same thing with um, Canon flashes and Nikon flashes. They're also very powerful. And again, if you want to put in, you know, white cards, to add more light. And this is a way to use two lights where at a 40 degree angle you can have white cards or silver cards. It's a great setup for contrast. It's great for showing off the edges. But you can have the light over here. You can have a light, you can have lights facing each other. And this is just one way to set up two lights. And again, there's many ways to position two lights. You might try feathering, but if you want to add light without adding a strobe, I'd recommend a silver card or a white card. And this, I have two lights. It's at a 45 degree angle. It's the same setup as before, but now I don't have a glass subject. If I didn't have this, then I have a silhouette. But you don't have to have the light here. You can have the light here or here. You can also have white cards or silver cards that bounce in light. This is how I use three lights. And this is in many ways to use three lights. You have your key light, main light. You have a background light, then you have an underneath table light. And there are many ways you can use this. Like if you want reflections, you want to move this light very close to the edge, and you want to aim the light at the subject, and you probably want to power down your strobe so you don't kill the reflections. Or if you, if you want to have it underneath, then the subject will be in like 
a floating characteristics where you want to power up your strobe. And I recommend using, in all lights, gels to change the background, to change the color. I recommend maybe a light color, a dark color, or a dark color and a light color. Lots you can do with gels. And the many way to position three lights, but you can also move the lights around. You can have this light come over here. You can also have um, white cards or silver cards that bounce in light. Michael, do you mind if I interrupt you and ask a question? Yeah, sure. Okay. You said something right then about reflections, and I understand if you put too much light on it, it's going to uh, get rid of that reflection. But tell me again what you just said about creating that reflection. Like if you want to put a reflection here, you probably want to move this back farther. And the ways to make this straight with, and I'll get to it later, where I talk about string clamps. And you want to move the light close to the edge. And you want to aim the light. You want to tilt the light at the subject. And you want to power down your strobe, probably the lowest setting. And that's what I do. Is there a certain relationship between the angle that you're tilting it back to the surface it's reflecting on? Well, you want the, you want the light go at a 40 50 angle. Okay. You want to bring out the reflections. And you want okay. to also move the glass back too, the here. Hey, Michael, someone had also asked, what's the purpose again of the light underneath? What effect are you getting from that? This is great for reflections. And it's also great for producing a very white background if you power up the strobe. And, and these, you would use this um, setup as opposed to your sweep setup when you're wanting, you know, your blue background there. Is that correct? Well, can you repeat that question? Um, you... um, a while ago, you showed us this awesome table that was basically a white sweep, and it was lighted all around. But here, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're lighting underneath, but you don't have that sweep back behind it. Is that because you're wanting to show off a different color back behind it? Well, I want to make it more contrasty, and also, if possible, maybe we do reflections. Remember, this okay. is plexiglass. On the first photograph, I had a white plastic sheet. So if I had a white, if I had a light under the plastic sheet, it wouldn't be too effective. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Now, let me see. Okay. These are ways. These are gels. And I have armature clips holding up the gel. This is the strobe. You can do the same thing with big spring clamps or big C and G clamps. You can even do it with clothespins. And then I use clothespins over here to hold up the blue gel to the strobe. This is how I flatten out the curve of the plexiglass table. I have, I can even have bigger uh, spring clamps, but these are pretty good. It's just to flatten up the curve. This is great for getting out the reflection. You can also do this with very, very big C clamps. I mean, big. And these are how spring clamps, they hold up like white foam walls or maybe plexiglass sheets. And this is great for bouncing in the light, or this is a, this could be like a scrim. The strobe would go here to soften the light. This is the scrim. These are stretcher frames I bought from Plaza Arts. And this is plastic fusion paper bought from BH. And this is just a grid to put on the strip box to make the light look more contrasting. This is great for portraits. It's also great for still light. And it also if you feather the light. Again, this is like a white wall. You have spring clamps attaching it to something else. And this is how I use a scrim. You could also use a white reflective scrim too. And this is also great for softening the light with the strip box, the strip light. So mid-section summary is that when you add a light, 
Suppose you want, suppose you have a light, see if you can add a white card or a silver card. Then maybe add another light, but place it on another strobe, try to add a white card and make it look more natural. Because the mistake I make in other people is that they add too much flash. White cards and silver cards are great for filling in shadows and, fi or, and for making the um, photograph look more natural. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the camera settings. This is what it looks like when I do still life. I'd like to start at 1 125th 1, and after 16. Since I always use tripod for still life, I like to use ISO 100. Sometimes I have to cut the shutter in half to 1 250th. And this is a 19 point focus selection. And this is a standard picture size that's the sharpest. And I'll talk about this. This is daylight. The temperature is balanced at 52K. And I like to leave it at that so that the temperature is consistent. And I'll talk about white balance soon. Like I said, I like to use 100 ISO 200 with the tripod. Without a tripod, maybe ISO 400 or ISO 800. And I always shoot in RAW. We talked about the picture style. And I like to use the evaluator mode for more contrasting pictures. But sometimes I could use the center weighted. Then I like to use the auto focus mode. It's good for still life. And this is single shooting. I could use other drive modes, but a lot of times I just use a single shooting. So I do one picture at a time. This is the daylight, uh, daylight white balance. I always use this. It's the most natural because it's the same temperature about. I never use AWS because it's the least natural. And you could add artificial color to the original photograph. And these are the temperatures. It's like to be at around 52K. Custom, you can set the Kelvin, but then there's custom white balance where you have to take a picture of a white card. But if the light changes, then you have to do a new custom white balance. And that's why I like to just use the daylight white balance because the temperature will be the same. This is the noise reduction. It's good to use one or two. Most of the time, it's use one. But when you use two, it'll take a while to get back to your original screen. Two is great uh, for correcting blue color cast. If you have a blue color cast, that's why they have this setting. When early DSLRs came out, they had this problem. But today's technology, they fixed it. And most modern DSLRs, don't have this blue color cast problem, but two is great for cutting blue color cast if you have this problem. Most of the time, I just use one. Now this is the ISO noise reduction. It's better to use zero, one, or two than three. I just like to use two. It take it. Does, it makes takes out the noise. It's better to use it than not to use it. And this is the another settings diagram. It's a color space. sRGB is great for posting on the web. It's about 15.7 million colors. Then there's Adobe RGB that's 57 million. I like to start with sRGB, but I know some people start with Adobe RGB. And then there's Profoto, which is 281 trillion. But I just like to either start with sRGB or Adobe. And then there's exposure bracketing, where sometimes I just take it a stop over and a stop under, depending on how much light. I do a lot of this outdoors. If it's two lights, if the light's really intense, it's two stops over, regular, and then two stops under.
this is I, this is what I use to clean my studio live tables. Novus is great. Novus one is great for a clean shine. But if you have little scratches, you want to use two. And then if there's big scratches, you want to use three. But most of the times, I just want to use one. You can buy this at Amazon or any car store. And the bottom screen here, it's great for blowing off dust. You definitely want to use this in the black plexi table. And I recommend just blowing off the dust. These come in handy. Or you can just get a linen cloth with a gentle width of one. This is what duct tape looks like. I use duct tape to hold stuff. This is armature wire, where if you want to have someone appear on an object appear in a floating characteristic, they did this in the early days of film using this. And you've seen these armature clips, and these are mirrors. These are mirror plates. You can put these mirrors on these clips for light. These are CAG clamps. These are great for holding stuff. You can buy this at any hardware store. And these are spring clamps. And these are great for holding like foam walls. These are great, like clothes pins are great for attaching gels to a strobe. And many things you can do with these spring clamps. These are gels, and I bought these at Plaza Arts. These are great for changing color of the background and changing the color of the subject. And these are silver cards. These are great for adding light or filling in shadow details. And these are gold cards. This is great for adding like a yellowish tint to a photograph. This is what Cinefill looks like. It's like black aluminum foil. This is great for attaching on a strobe with clothes pins. It's a lot cheaper than buying a snoot. And this is draft film paper. This is great for you know creating black fusion material or plastic fusion material. And these are what my scrims look like. Sometimes you can just buy the frame, like I bought this at Target, and I bought the draft paper at Plaza Arts, or you can buy stretcher frames, and you can put them together, and you can buy the fusion material somewhere else like BH. And these are my white, my white plexi sheets, my clear plexi sheets, and my black plexi sheets, and the ways you use all this, like for white flexi sheets, there's things you can do like if you do food, you want to have it like a floating motion. If like a white background on the floor, that's one way to do it. You'd also do the same thing with this white flexi sheet. And you could also create like a little table of a black flexi sheet. So there's many ways to use the white flexi sheet. and the black plexi sheet and the clear plexi sheet. And these are what my white cards look like. They come in all sizes. This is great for adding light. This is great for food photography. And depending on how you use the white card, you can create like a white, a gray background, depending on where you angle the light. And these are black cards, great for creating black backgrounds, also great for creating light backgrounds. And black cards are great for like if there's too much, if a strobe gives too much light, you can control the light by blocking part of the light in the strobe. So now I'm going to talk about, first of all, any questions? Now I'm going to go into Adobe I'm Camera. sorry, I'm sorry, Michael. I do have a quick question. 
um, your white plexiglass and your black plexiglass. Where did you purchase those from? Um, the white plexi sheets I purchased at Lowe's. And then I purchased a black at Amazon. But it was a big piece. But then I only cut one, one of the pieces in two with the power saw and duct tape. And then the clear black seek sheets, you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. You can buy this at hardware stores too. We had a question in the chat. Why do you have noise with a properly exposed image? Noise? Yeah, I like to control I like to try to control the noise. That's how I was taught. But why do you have it? I want to try to tone down the noise. But then I, that's how I, I did it. But the question is, why is there noise in the first place? If the image is properly exposed, you shouldn't have noise. I was told that you may have noise, depending on the exposure. What if it's a long exposure? What if it's like a five second exposure? Why would you need a five second exposure for something that's not moving? Well, how do you know that there's no noise in the file? Well, I can always disable it too. I can always tone it. I can always, but I just like to try to take advantage of some of the camera settings. Well, I know what you could do. You could also cut the shutter speed in half to reduce the noise. You can do that. And plus sometimes I usually start at ISO 100, 200, but then if you use higher ISO like 400 or 800 or 1600, they're going to be a little more noise, but Technology is advancing. They're trying to take care of that. I, I guess what we're trying to get at, though, is with um, tabletop stuff that you're you're using lights and whatnot. You should absolutely just be shooting at ISO 100, and with a properly exposed image, there shouldn't be any noise. I, in my opinion, using noise reduction in that situation would be a, a waste of time and and use of the camera because it, you don't need it. I could do that. And sometimes people say that sometimes these image stabilization, some people say to use, do not use image, image stabilization with a tripod. I use both and I don't notice a difference. I use, I took a picture with image stabilization without, and I didn't notice a difference. And I try the same thing with noise too and stuff like that. So the people are correct with the, the tripod not using image stabilization, though? Right. I'm always experimenting. I always like to – I just do things differently. All right, now we're going to go to Adobe Camera Raw. Or with the white plexi images. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up in camera raw, but I'm going to reset it. I'm going to set it back to default. We're going to start all over. I'm going to go to camera raw, control R. I'm going to reset to the default. We're going to start all over. So I'm going to open up this image. Get the white balance tool. The best thing to do is use a gray card or try to find a white. And then you make slow adjustments. You work your way down. So 
to form an S over here with the curve. For detail, I like to um, use at least 140. Portrait, I use something lower. Noise reduction, I like to use 50. I don't like the cuts of color mixture. I know that you can do stuff with color grading. I like to not touch this. Optics, I like to remove chromatic aberrations. I like to use a profile. I could have a vignetting problem. Now, I'm going to select all of them. I'm going to do Control R. I'm going to do Control A. I'm going to right click. I'm going to sync the settings so they all have the same thing. Hey Michael, are you doing this because you shot all three of these at the same time, same settings, same lighting? The lighting may be a little different, but I want to try to use the same uh, white balance settings. Did you use the same setup for these three shots? These first two I did. Okay. But this one's a little different. Just out, like also, just out of curiosity, do you use a Macbeth chart? Excuse me? So just out of curiosity, do you use a Macbeth chart? I sometimes you use a color checkered for the white balance. Sometimes you just find a gray. I want to make sure that the geometry is correct, so I like to just check this. Now, basically, these two are done with the same setup. This one's a little differently, where if I do in camera raw, obviously, this image has a problem. The background is killing the subject. So what I like to try doing is get the brush out. I like to tone down the exposure a little. So now I'm going to go into Adobe Photoshop. What are those images at the bottom? Is Excuse that me? what are those images at the bottom? Is that like a doll on a tabletop? Oh, you mean that that's a model that I work with? Let me Oh, I thought it was a doll. I'm sorry I don't have my glasses. Yeah, just doing a silhouette. Oh, cool. Can you show us those when we're done? We'll yeah. Cool. Yeah. So basically what I like to do is I like these actions a little differently where 
I'm going to be showing my action screen a lot. I like to use button mode because all we do is click buttons, but this action, I'm going to show you what happened inside. See, this is, I have actions I call each other. So when I click, when I click the button, I, more than one action happens. When I click this, I call their actions, they make changes, I call their actions, I call the black signature, I call the white, because I'm only going to use one. All I do is click buttons and things happen. That's how I use actions. It's quicker. I'm going to check the cat. Okay. Now I, now I also use blending modes. I use this at a Lumosity level. I first I'm going to invert the image. You know, white hides. I mean, white. I'm sorry. White reveals black hides. So. What I'm going to do, I'm using a very, very soft brush, normal blend bed of 100%. And there are many ways to use this. Some people just like to make the shadow the shadows more powerful. And the same thing when you dodge the highlights. I like to just I like to color in the whole image. I'm going to now, I'm going to dodge in the highlights. You know, some people just like just to paint the highlights. I like to do the whole thing. So all this is done and when I click that button, all this happens. Now, there's other, other techniques I can do too. Like for instance, I want to select the subject, but I already select inverse. And I can put this in a layer mask. If, this, if the background's too powerful, Then there's frequency separation. And this is a free download if you just Google frequency separation. Where this is for the high frequencies. I like to do a lot of cloning here. And then this is good for making selections, doing content aware.
suppose I wanted to enter this in, suppose I want to put a block frame. I'm going to go to my actions. I'm going to show what See, this is, this is what I use, the block action, block frame. I have a condition. I'm calling other actions. And then if I look at the settings, the longest side is 400 pixels. And the shortest side is 2910. This is how I enter for print competition, but I think they also changed the resolution to 200. It used to be 300. And then when I save it, I do an export, do a quick export, quality 100, and I convert to sRGB, and then I put copyright info. I'm not going to save the changes. I'm going to open up the other one. And then I run through the same thing. Give me actions. Because I have an action for this, an action for this. So all this is done when I click that button. All this appears. I'm going to invert it. So I'm just painting in the improvements of the mask. White reveals, black hides. I like to use a middle slider of the levels to bring out the reflections. I'm going to click on this. I'm going to show what these actions look like. So basically, I'm calling the despicable filter. I'm calling the dust and scratches filter. I'm calling the sharpen filter. And when I click that button, all those actions happen. Look at my history. See the last thing, the speckle, the dusts and scratches. When I click that button, all those actions happen. It's a black and white filter. Out of my history. Actually, I'll just do it like this.
I have many actions. Suppose I wanted to do a white frame. Actually, This is the cookie file. And I'm going to get that action. So I click that button, all this happens. A brush mode normal, capacity 100. I'm also burning at a Lumosity blend mode. Now this file, the background is way overpowering, so do control D. I think I'll just do select subjects. I'll do select inverse. I want to put this in a layer. Mask. Oops. Put this in adjustment. I want to tone down. This is great for color correction, the auto. I'm going to do control Z. This bottom dropper is great for making the photograph white. Control D the control E to kick back the change. And this is great for making the photograph appear black. This is great when you have a black, a lot of black. So any questions on how I use Photoshop? Yeah, so I, um, I'm um i just kind of curious. So you're doing like your product stuff for like art is what you're doing? Because um, one, one of the things I noticed about your glue, like Elmer's glue has pretty strict standards on what color their products would be to adhere to their, their product brand. And with your some of your filters, you're completely changing the colors, so I, oh. that would, wouldn't be for um, for the company. So you're doing it as like print competition stuff is what you're doing. That's what I would do it for. I know that some people don't like to edit photographs and product photography. Correct. No, I mean I, I do it professionally as a job, and I do, but I'm I'm making sure that the products adhere to the the company's standards and, and meet their the specific color. And, and, and certain other things. So I was just curious as what you're doing with these photos. Oh, I was just trying to make the photos better in terms of color enhancements. Like I like to use frequency adjustment for spot healing and stuff like that. Hey, Michael, 
Are you only using your images for print competition or are you also doing this work for businesses? Well, I do it for print competition. I also try to do it for business too. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. All right, these are some of my Facebook groups. I have a Wait, big- did you, did you do like a lipstick shoot? Can you show us that one? I thought that was kind of neat. Lipstick shoot? Yeah. yeah. Can uh, you see that? I was thinking um, about shooting some makeup for my makeup artist at the studio. Um, I bought some stuff for Flatley, but I, I thought I saw you do some lipstick. Okay, I may have to do a new screen share because that's, let me bring up my portfolio. I have a newbie question. So it looked like, um, you know, you're talking about the lighting and, you know, um, the angle and position is very important and everything, but you were able to do a lot of stuff in post. Yeah. So could you do the same thing if you had like a studio box and put plexi um, in the bottom of that? Could you kind of get the same effect? Oh, you can like changing the color of the background and the color of the subject. I mean, I, I guess I just yeah. I have a studio box that I haven't used. And then when you were talking, I was thinking if I put the plexiglass on the bottom, I could get that same reflective look, but I haven't really used it a lot. So that's why I was asking. You can. I like to use Photoshop a lot. I think you're talking about this file, right? Can Kelly, you see my screen? Now I did enter this in IPC and I got a good critique. Um, that's not it. There was like tubes of lipstick, like the lipstick was like, like, like it was opened. No, 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 no. What's well, some of those? I saw some and it, so I was going to ask you how you did the effect. It almost looked like like lipstick that had had a wear pattern. And I was like, that's so cool. He must be using it for a real makeup artist. I wanted to know how you did that. Well, this is just a straight white background. This is like- Yeah, I think this was like three tubes side by side. I saw it somewhere. Is it black plexi? Oh. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh. I think I know which. Did it have reflections in it? I think so, yeah. Okay, I think, let's see. I was just wondering if you did that in Photoshop because it looked like naturally like somebody had been actually applying it. I thought that was pretty cool. I think I could locate that file. Um, no. Um, I thought it maybe it was, it might've been on your Instagram. That might be where I saw it. Yeah. Um, it's okay. I don't want to get you off topic. You can okay. make it up later how you did it. Okay, let's see. New scare. Oh, let's see what the heck am I doing? Okay. Um, so these are my Facebook groups. I change this to still I find art because that's what a lot of people are posting, including myself. It's growing every day. This is other groups. These are some of the meetup groups. These are my business links. I use Instagram every day, try to post stuff. It's my portfolio, what I just showed you.
Okay, this is now part two, the black plexiglass table. And there's a difference, you can use a scrim similar, but then you can't, you will use a scrim differently. And I'll present that uh, later. And these are some sample images and there are ways to produce the strobes for the edges. And when you use a black plex table photo processing, you would probably clone a lot more and you'll probably become a good friend of, you'll probably use the frequency separation a lot. It's great for clever cloning, taking out white specks you don't want in the photograph. And tonight's agenda, of course, now we're gonna talk about the black flex table, how to use the lights and also how to use uh, non-electronic lighting modifiers like white cards, silver cards. Then we'll talk about camera settings. And then I have a demo in a camera raw, and then a demo in Photoshop. And I'll talk about how basically the same thing. How I use blend modes, how I combine actions. All you have to do is click buttons, and how I use filters. And tonight's focus will be the black plexiglass tip. Like the white flex table, you can use the same modifiers. You can use silver or mirror to add light in a strong way. Then if you want to add light in a soft way, you can use like white reflectors, white cards. And then black cards are great for taking out glares on a product. White card and black cards are great when a strobe bleeds too much light. Then you have plastic fusion scrims or white reflector scrims. They're great you know, for making the light softer. And you can use gels like the white plexi. You can do the same with the black plexi. And you use white plexiglass sheets. You could attach it with a spring clamp like you do with the white plexi table. And you use cinephil the same way. And blinds, they work the same way. When you have your subject, you want to make sure that you angle the blinds so the light hits the subject at a 45 degree angle to make good contrast. And then, you know, spring clamps, your G clamps, they're great for holding stuff, and I'll demonstrate that later. And you can use clothespins and duct tape, like the white plex table. And these are the various stores you can buy this at. There are many ways to use this black plex table. You can use it with one light, you can have two lights, three lights, you can have natural light, you can have white cards, silver cards. And the ways you use a scrim, it's different than the white plex table. This is at a 45 degree angle. And then later, I'm going to talk about this coming up, how you use it at a 45 degree angle and a 90 degree angle. This is how to use it at a 45 degree angle where this is plywood I bought from a hardware store. I have a big drill that drills a hole, and this is like a pole. And the plexi sheet, black plexi sheet, it's really an eight foot plexi sheet, but I cut it in half. I actually had to cut another six inches off because it wouldn't fit in the car, but I only had to do the one side. And I bought that in the place near BWI airport. And there are ways you could use White cards, the bouncing light, silver cards. And this is how to use one light. You have the light parallel to this slant. And this is good for having jewelry done at a slant. You want to have the jewelry laid flat. And then I'll talk about how to have another light. But there's other ways to use just one light with this. This is how to use it at a 90 degree angle. If you have just one light, like you could use it just with glass because the light, the, the light will shine right through the glass. And then there's ways you can have vignetting effect and non-vignetting effect, and I'll show you how to do that. And this is great if you just have one light shining right through the glass. Now, later on, 
if you have like, but I'll talk about this later. If this is like a non-glass subject, you could have a light here, you could have a light here. And again, you could add mirrors, you could add white cards, gray cards, I mean, silver cards to add in light. Again, this is done at 90 degrees. And this is a glass subject, and I'm only having one light because the light shines through the glass subject. And I decided to cut the light in half by way of position. I want to have more of a vignetting effect. I'll talk about how to do with this nine glass subject. And this is the same thing. You have the plec, you have the scrim at 90 degrees. And there's a big difference because I rose the light up. I want to bring this out better. And this is a glass subject. And you can also make the light farther away to soften it. And also lessen the power of the strobe to control it. And also raise the aperture too. And this is another way to use you know, one strobe, this is a glass subject. This is great for bringing out the edges. And this is glass and it's a black foam. And the most important part of the photograph is the edges. Now, if this were a solid, I would have, have to have the light with the snoot. But this is glass and so the light will shine right through. And you can also add in white cards, the bouncing light, Silver cards. And this is another light. It's a product where the light is coming at a 40 degree angle. And this is like a white scrim reflector. This is a boom hey, stand. Hey, Michael, can I interrupt you for a sec? Yeah. Can you go back one slide, please? Yeah. So in this photograph, do you have three pieces of black plastic behind the glass? This is just a strobe. There's no plastic here. This is just like a, a foam board. Because what you're doing is you don't want to have a scrim here because you need as much, you need a lot of light to light up the edges. Ah. So this is the strobe. This is like the, um, the softbox of a strobe. Gotcha. You want to power up the strobe so you bring out the edges. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. And All right. Wow. And that's, okay. Gotcha. Good. No, oh, thanks. Thank you. Now, there are many ways to use one light. But I try to add like a white card or a silver card. I mean, sometimes some people add too much strobe light. And it looks more natural if you have a white card or a silver card. But you can under the strobe too. But try adding a white card or a silver card in place of a strobe. Well, this is how you have two lights. The scrim is at a 40 degree angle, and this light is parallel to this. Now suppose this were a mug, and then I have this light. It'll come out as a silhouette, if that's what you want. That's why we got to have a light here, or you could have a light here. You can also put mirrors to put in light. Wait, did you say suppose this was a bug? Yeah, suppose this were a mug. A, bu a bug like a moth? No, a, you know, a drinking mug? Oh, I thought you meant like a moth, like a bug. Okay. Oh, no, I don't photograph bugs. <laughs> yeah, but moths are not bugs. Okay. Yes, bug. bug, I'm sorry. <laughs> so as many ways you can use two lights. You have a background light, you have your key light. And this is not like this is a mug here, a drinking mug. If this were the only light, this would come as a silhouette. And I gotta have a light coming at a 40 degree angle for contrasted light. Where I could have it here, I could also have white cards to help put detail in the shadows. And we talked about how I made the scrim, stretcher frames and from Plaza Arts.
This is with two strobes at a 45 degree angle. This is a watch. This is a black foam board. You want to make sure that you position the watch so that the circular numbered part is showing good. I'd also recommend using like a white reflective scrim. Depends what you want to do. Maybe just use a scrim for here to take out that harsh glare. Or if it bleeds too much light, you want to put like a white card, I mean a black card. I have a question. And this, Michael, this slide? can you go back one step? I have a question. Yeah. So when you're saying if you have too much light, you use the black card, why would you do that as opposed to turning down the power on the strobe? You can. Okay. You see, sometimes my strobes are so powerful, even at two, there's still too much light coming out. And that's why here, if this I maybe I could turn this down, but it's still very, very powerful. And that's why you, sometimes okay. you have to shape so, your light. Oh. Right. But could you, and I'm just asking because I don't, I don't do this kind of work, but could you, instead of using that black flag since you can't turn it down, could you, you not increase your shutter speed a little bit? You can do that too. And I've done that before. Okay. So there's many things you can do. What I like to do is when I take a photograph, I like to try to control these lightings, try to get this right, try to go with one light at a time. Maybe out a white card, black card, or silver card. Gotcha. I'm working the exposures. Okay. Now, this is with two strobes. This is also with natural light. Now, it's a harsh natural light, so I'd put a white reflector to make it not so harsh. I'm going to make sure that the blinds are aiming at a 45 degree angle. And you want to have like a contrasty shadow. And they could look interesting. Now, this is a little harsh, so, but just for teaching purposes. Then you have three strobes. You have tear here, and you have a key light. And sometimes you can also put a snoot here, and I've done that before. And this whole thing is to make the product label stand out. So the, my midsection summary is this. Try using one light. Define what you want to do. Then see if you can add like a white card or a silver card in place of electronic light. But then you may have to get a light, electronic light. So that, you know, you can do a lot with the white card. You can do a lot with the silver card. So any questions? What uh, what kind of lights are you using? These are Elochrome strobes. I've only these are really reliable. They always work. I used to use Canon flashes, but I stopped using them because they were old. But I've I've used these Elochrome strobes for years. Okay. So, so were you showing constant? I'm sorry. Go ahead. So if you're using strobes, then once you actually use your aperture to affect the exposure and not your shutter speed? What I like to do, you can. Sometimes I have an aperture of 16, 1 25th. What I like to do is cut the shutter in half of 1 250th, it, it exposes it better. Or I could go up to F20. Well, when I cut the shutter in half from 1 25th to 1 250th, I seem to have better control of the exposure. You can also lower the power of the strobe too. You can also you can put several scrims. You can put like a snoot. And I've used snoots before that helps control the light. Have any other questions? I do. So the, the lights that you were showing in the strobes, were those the Ellen Chromes? I, for some reason I thought they were constant. Sorry. Oh, these are Elochrome. No, the where you had two. Were those the Ellen Chromes that you had side to side? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I thought that they were uh, okay. constants. So just to help you out with the CPP test that you're studying for, your, your shutter speed doesn't uh, affect your exposure when you're using 
strobes like that. So at yeah. ISO 125th of a second, or at 125th of a second at ISO 100 at F16, you would have basically a pitch black um, screen if you did not fire your strobes. So your shutter speed's not going to affect your exposure at all. It's your your aperture or your ISO or adjusting the level of the strobe. So yeah, but sometimes um, when I cut the shutter in half, like the sync speed, the Canon is two one two fiftieth. It's a minimum shutter speed. Yeah, no, I, I understand that, but it's I worked for Canon, so um, but the the your shutter speed is not it does not affect your exposure with a strobe. Yeah. It, it's just your ISO, your aperture, or adjusting the. I, I'm just trying to help you. You said you're studying for your CPP. Yeah, that's and, true. It's the aperture, ISO, and camera adjustment. Yeah, the shutter. Yeah, that's right. Now, in natural light, it's different without any shows. You could have as short a shutter speed as you like, like one, one thousandth. Now, these are called COG clamps. And this is how I hold it up at a 40 degree angle. It's great for holding stuff. And this is how I hold it at where the scrim's at 90 degrees. These are, these are medium-sized uh, C clamps. You could also use the spring clamps, both of these. And again, these are spring clamps doing the same thing as the C or G clamps. This is how I attach the gels to a strobe with clothes pins. This is a grid. It's great for making the light more interesting and contrasting. And this is how how I create a scrim wall. I was just doing two for demonstration. This could be like a white card, and this could be like a strobe, because it softens the light. And then these are white cards. You have a strobe here, it can bounce in light, or a silver card. These are silver cards. This is great for bouncing in light. I would just doing this to display it. I would have a silver card here and maybe a strobe here at a 40 from your angle. You can also do this with gold walls, but I just like to use silver. Then there are black cards. And when a strobe bleeds out too much light, you cover part of the strobe. And then you can also use a small black card if you're doing a product, if you want to take out a glare. It's a way to control the light. These are the settings, and I usually use this with the strobe. Yeah, like you said, if I were to use this without a strobe, you'd be pitch black because it's way underexposed. If I were outside, I'd move this down to 800 if it's a sunny day, sunny 16 year old, because once, yeah, but since I'm using a strobe, I have to have this at F16. Because sometimes if I change this to 1 to 50th, the sync speed is 1 to 50th of, of a can. And this is, we talked about the daylight white bounce. Like the shoot and raw. We talked about the settings. Michael, do you ever use high speed sync? Um, yeah. For the tabletops? Yeah. Um, oh, as a the drive mode? Yeah. Um, He's talking about high-speed sync on the strobe, being able to go over your sync speed of your shutter. Oh, um... I think, yeah, I, I see. I, I don't use that too often. Okay. Now, in a shooting bulb mode, this is what I do for light painting. I use that bulb here, F16. 
And depending on the power of the lead flashlight, you could easily have an overexposed image. And that's why in light painting, it's a different topic, but like to use like foil filters, you need to use pipes. They're like, you put on a flashlight and it softens the light. And that's a different topic. So how powerful of an LED flashlight are you using? I like to use maybe lumens of, it depends. One of my LED flashlights is 3000 lumens. That's a powerful light, especially when you do something small. And I like to use maybe 150 lumens for something small. But then when you step outside, uh, that big Lumens 3000 power LED flashlight, that's not enough where you have to do a, a painting a really long time. And that's why I have to get out another light or a 6000 little LEDs. And it's a lot more powerful. Like, do you think that's powerful enough to see down like in a well or something? If I a light paint a well? No, like to shine it down into a well, would that light up a well? I think it would, a lead one, like a 3000 lumens one would, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, because it's way dark in those wells, okay. Because when you put light paint outside, it's a different ball game. It's a lot more darker. A lot more darker outside? Oh yeah. When you try light painting a car, trust me, there's a difference when you light paint inside and when you light paint outside, a big difference. Oh, okay. It's a different, it's a different characteristic. We're talking about the white balance. I like to use daylight at 50 QK. I like to use the same thing. It's about the same temperature. And I never use auto white balance because you put artificial ingredients in the photograph. And then there's, you can set the Kelvin, but then you can do a custom white balance is where you put the camera in a manual focus, shoot a white card. Now, if the light changes, then you have to do a new custom white balance. And that's why I just like to use daylight or I could just adjust a Kelvin to 55K. Now, I know some people don't like to use noise reduction on a properly exposed photograph, but this is how I was taught, where if you use long exposures, you could have a blue color cast, but, but then modern DSLs, they've taken care of that problem. So you're just probably good just using one. You probably don't ever, ever need to use two. Or you could just turn it off. But... Most of the time, I just use one. What about option three? What is option three? Uh, this is only one, zero, one, two. That's another slide. Oh, this? Yeah, I thought there was option three in the last time you talked about option three. Like the noise reduction, you mentioned one, two, or three? Yeah, that's another slide. Okay. Zero, one, two, three. Oh, okay. And I have it at one. This is what you're referring to, right? Yes. Maybe you just have it at zero standard, but then you could disable it. But I never have any problems using a high speed because sometimes my, my photographs are slightly underexposed. And that's why I try to use this. So depending on what you want to do, maybe you can just have zero standard. Depends on what you need to do. Sometimes you can use two, right? Yeah. Other times and three. The technology is changing that. Right. So really probably just use, can. you don't have to even use the high ISO speed. But you can. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about the white bounce and, you know, for color space, some people say it's easier for color correcting the sRGB, maybe you could try Adobe RGB and I talked about the amounts of colors. We talked about exposure bracketing. Now, you the white balance the shift? Excuse me? You ever use the white balance shift? I never use that, but I've seen it being used. I like to leave that alone. 
But then maybe I could look at that. Or maybe if I'm probably to reset the camera to default settings, just make sure you change a few things to raw to the JPEG and then from continuous, you gotta make a few adjustments. I never touched the white balance shift. You know what that's used for, correct? You wanna shift the color? I never touched that. I'm, I don't, I don't like that. It's for getting an accurate white balance. So when you shoot white balance, the camera is not going to record it perfectly. So you utilize that to be able to shift. So you have RGB, right? And a lot of times, even if you do a custom white balance and you shoot a custom white balance, your R and your G might be at 50, but your B might be uh, 59. And so then you will shift your... Oh. Your custom opposite of the blue to bring it down so you can then match that so you can have a perfectly color calibrated photo. Well, I like to shoot the white or gray card or a color checkered. I looked at the white shift. I tried applying around. I like to leave that alone, but I could experiment. Now, we talked about how to clean the black flexi table. You could use Novus. We talked about one, two, and three. One's for shine, two's for little scratches, and three's for big scratches. Now, the black plexiglass, this drives every still life photographer kind of crazy. You're going to have a lot of light dust specks. So that's why, right before you do a shoot, squirt some air to so blow off the dust specks. Because you're going to do a lot more cloning with the black plexi table than the white. And you probably do a lot more shiny. As I said, it's different than the white. We've seen these uh, small mirrors, these armature clips for holding up the mirror plates. And these are duct tape. It's great for attaching gels to a strobe. And there's a lot you can do with this armature wire to hold stuff. These are CAG clamps. These are good for holding up scrims at a 90 or a 40 frame view angle. You get the same with this. You can hold up scrims. You can use clothespins for gels. These are gels to alternate the color of the subject and they alternate the color of the backgrounds. I recommend using a light color and a dark color for good contrast. We talked about mirror cards, routing in light if you don't want to use a strobe or filling in detail in the shadow. Then you have gold cards if you want to light with the yellowish taint. This is good for portraits in some ways, depending on the sunlight you have. You get Cinefill. This is great for creating a strobe on a very tight budget. This costs about 25, 30 bucks on Amazon or pH. I got this at 15, but this is great for creating a strobe with clothespins. This is, we talked about film drastic draft paper. It's great for putting a fusion background or softening the light. We talked about the scrim frames. You can buy the frames. You can make them from Plaza Arts. And you've seen these before. Clear flexi sheets, white flexi sheets, black. You use them anyways. And we talked about this. These are big white cards. They come in all sizes. These are black cards. It's great for when a strobe bleeds too much light. This is great for food photography. If you want to bounce in light, you could also use it a silver card that bounce in light. So now I'm going to go to, let's see. I'm going to do a new share. Hmm. Okay, I just got, I think it just timed out this year. So now, I'm going to go to the black flexi files. I'm going to reset it. 
Open up camera raw. I just want to reset it. I'm going to start all over. We could also do Control R, Control or Command R. I'm going to reset the file. I'm going to go to reset the fault. I'm going to press the three dots. I'm just going to do one at a time because I shot this different times. See, this is the nightmare. You see all this dust? And there's ways you can use a blower to blow some of them off, but you'll still be cloning. It's best to do this with the gray card. I think the highlights are too strong. I just want to improve the clarity just a little. I don't want to touch the vibration and saturation. I want to try to make an S curve with this. So the fault is 40, but I like to use over 140. Noise reduction, about 50. Increase just a little. I'm not going to touch the color mixer. You can, this is great for just in the color of the highlights, midtones, shadows. I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to make sure that I, when I correct distortion, I just like to use this. It does a lot of good work. Now, this file may still have a problem. See, the light's not even here, right? So I want to try to, try to control that. So I want, to, I want you to look at this. I don't want you to look at the edges. Control R. Try to set the white balance by finding a neutral. I think the highlights are too powerful. And I like to use sharpening. Put like the noise regression at 50. I like to move any chromatic aberrations, any color problems. I like these lens profile corrections. I like to just use the automatic auto feature. And I like to make the color even. I want you to look at this. I want to take away those distractions. The same thing, camera raw. The best way to do this is with the gray card or color checkered. But sometimes I just like to use, try to find a neutral.
Look at the image. Let's see. Well, I like to turn down the highlights. I have a lot of stuff here I got to correct. Like to take away any chromatic aberration problems, use profile corrections. Geometry, I'd like to use the auto feature. And I like to make the lighting even. So I want you to look at this, not this. I'm going to go into Adobe Photoshop. I'm going to just see if I can. I'm not going to save changes. Now I'm going to open the black plexi images. <clears throat> find those images. So we just processed the raw file. I got to move this. Again, I'm just going to use the actions I regularly use. So yeah, these are actions for this. This is a set of act. This is a set of actions for this. I'll throw this layer away. I'll move this signature down here. So I just want to mask in white reveals black hides. So I burned in detail, masking it in, at a blend mode of luminosity. Now I'm going to use a stream blend mode. I'm going to put add, contribute to the lighting characteristics. And some people just highlight the product, they highlight the model. Now, since we're doing black plexi, actually what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do actions, I'm going to bring out the frequency separation. I like to use a high frequency, a lot of stuff. Now, this away. When you use this clone, make sure this is not checked because we're working in individual layers. Because if it's not checked, if it is checked, it won't work right. And this is great for clever cloning.
I like to use a low frequency. Control Z, just. I'm not using a low frequency. I like to use content aware on that. Most times I just use a high frequency. But there's a shortcut I like to do in this. That's the white points. I like to do this. Black points, makes it black, makes the subject stand out just by using the black pointer. <coughs> the most important part is this. <coughs> Sorry. Let's see a chat. Oh, well, that's she. Okay. Black plexi, you can do a lot more cloning. And there's ways to work around that, um, making the photo more dark. And then if I want to put a frame... Suppose I were to put this in print competition. Here's the frame, but here are the settings. The, lo the height is the longest, 4,000. Got to remember to change it to 200 pixels per inch, not 300. They made a change. So the longest side, which case is the height, is 4,000 pixels. We talked about how I save the files. Let's see. Go to my actions. Again, I'm playing one action after another. I play the speckle, I play the dust and scratches, I play sharpen. I'm gonna make it smaller. I'm glad I'm not the only one who has trouble grabbing that corner. Yeah, I think a lot of people do, yeah. Um, so I'm not gonna just I missed the part where you made that the border. Did you oh. did you go over that or well here's the thing, I'll bring it out again. Um where This is, you know, this is the black frame where I play an action called somewhere else. I have a condition. If the document is landscape, then I call these set of actions. And I have other conditions. So this, this, when I click on this, all this is play, and this is a gray frame, right color actions, and then a white, I call it actions.
And I'm just going to open up the raw file, already processed in the raw. We got work to do in this image. But I'll throw it away the other adjustment layer. I don't need it. So when I click on the Dodge Filter button, all this happens. So now I'm painting on a black glass, but I'm painting in white because I want to reveal the product more. I want to make sure my brush mode is normal and it passes you 100. Some people just paint what they want to improve, but I like to paint everything. So I'm going to go to a navigator. The navigator to make this smaller. So I'm going to do a, a frequency separation. Let's see, I got to wait this. I just want to increase the radius to make it more powerful. I like to just use about 40 or about that, 40 or about 40. And this is the high frequency where make sure that sample all layers is not checked. Make sure my clone. Oops, I go backwards. I just went to a little fast. So in a black plexi, you'll do more cloning. I like to use the low frequency. Do shift F5 for content aware. You can do a lot with this, but I'm just going to use content aware. The shift F5 brings up the content aware. Now come up here, I want to make this a lot a darker, quicker. Because I want people to look at this, not the outside. It's a way to enhance the product. Then I'm going to go put a black frame on this. Well, actually, what I'm going to do is before I do that, Go to my history. I just called it speckle filter, the dust and scratches filter, and sharp mask. And I have all the settings set. And then when I click that button, when I click that button, it runs one action right after another. All I have to do is click buttons. And then I'm going to put a frame on, a black frame, because black is complementary. You want to complement the photograph. I put a white frame. You would look, I want you to look at the objects. 
So a frame should complement the photographs. Watch what happens when I put the white frame. Because it's now, this frame is pulling you away from the image. But I want that. I want, I want the frame to bring you in the image. And watch what happens if I were to put the white frame. Not a white, but if this were white, this would pull you away from the image. That's why we use black frame. Because this is black, the frame is black. I want to draw you to the image. So I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to back up a little bit to the frequency separation. What's the main purpose of that? Just to mostly to get rid of the dust specks? This is great. This is like a even, you can think of it as another layer, but this is even more intelligent way to correct the clone. You want to make sure this is not sample because it's a separate layer. Yeah. And I like to clone using the high frequency. And then some people did do this. They have separate layers for every tool here. So there are many ways to use the frequency uh, separate the frequency um, separation. And the goal is to get rid of the dust, right? Right. Yeah. Just a clever way to, if you have a lot of dust, I'd recommend using the frequency separation. Try cloning with the high frequency. And then the no, low is just, you want to do a content aware with the selection. Okay. There are many ways to use the high, the frequency separation. And then the settings for the, you know, you know, obviously the height is 4,000. It's the longest side. And I haven't set it at 300. i got to set it at 200 because they made some changes in the IPC. Okay. Another way to do this, if you want to correct the actions, I'm going to get out of button mode. It's tricky work doing it. What you could do is like this. You can make the change here and click OK. That's a way to correct an action. I'm not going to save it, so I'm going to have one more file. So I'm opening up the raw file, not the card file, the CRT file. I'm going to minimize my screen. Then I'm going to go to my actions. I'm just going to click buttons. So one of the layers, I'm going to throw this layer layer because I don't need it. When I click that button, it combines several actions. When I'm brush mode of normal, pass you 100, and I'm trying to paint in the characteristics. I'm going to reveal more of the product. White reveals black hides. And then, since I have a lot of cloning to do, that's where I get the actions. So when I improve the radius for more powerful effect, let's go about, let's see about 35. 
about at 40. I'm going to use a higher frequency. Make sure this is not checked. And if I want to use content aware, I use the low frequency. Shift F5 brings up content aware. You can also paint, you can also 50 cent gray, black, but I'm gonna use content aware. Shift F5, content aware is already selected. Now I'm gonna make this more dark quicker. Now, we have a, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the raw file. It's going to be blurry, but I don't care because what I'm going to do is I'm trying to connect some vignetting. I'm trying to keep this light out here. So I want people to look at the subject. I want to. I want, to, I want the subject to be more powerful than the background. That's why I'm trying to use the middle slider to adjust the contrast. And I'm going to run my actions. Whoops, actions. I'm going to do my frames. I'm going to do my frame. And since this is black background, I'm gonna use a black frame because black, a black frame of color will, will complement this type of photograph. So, any questions on how I do Photoshop? Nah, I think you went over it multiple times. Okay, yeah. Michael, these are great images. Oh, good. I'm glad you like them. Uh, and I know we I know I got more learning to do too because there's so much going on, things changing. I'm gonna, you know. Okay, I'm gonna do a new share. Let's see. So so Michael, I have one question. You essentially follow the same procedure pretty much on when you're using the black table that you showed us on all the images you shoot on the black table. Yeah. Um I try to do the same thing. So that series of steps you had, uh, uh, where you had uh, uh, levels adjustment, you had frequency separation, et cetera, you pretty much go through that like a flow chart almost each yeah. time. Yeah, and they're all, and the frequency separation, if you Google frequency separation, it's a free download. Yeah, okay. Just Google frequency separation. You, you come, across, come across a site called PH Learn. They teach a lot of Photoshop there too. Yeah, those are those are great. You mean learn? Excuse me. I saw those great photographs. The photographs you made on that table, on that black plexiglass table, are just uh, uh, they're outstanding. I mean, okay, I'm glad you like the images. Yeah. Michael, you were we you, talked you, to them on my Facebook groups. You were uh, you were saying though, check out Flurn. Is that what you were talking about? If you Google frequency separation, you could come across a site called PHL Learn or something. Yes, it's Flurn. Say that again? Flurn. Yeah. I think you can get it there. It's Google. not an abbreviation. It's a word. It's Flurn. Oh, Flurn. Yeah, that's right. God. I learned a lot from them. They they have a lot of um, videos on frequency separation. And they also tell you, you just Google frequency separation and you come across a free download. And also, the tutorial there is a free Flurn. It's good information. And these are my still F groups and my business links. God. So 
So we could reach out to the U at that email address then? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay, I think I've answered the vegan separation. It's just a clever way to clone. So any other questions?